Robert C. O'Brien was the presidio name for Robert Leslie Connolly, who was born on January 11, 1918, in Brooklyn, New York. He was the third of five children born to Leslie and Agnes O'Brien Connolly. Both parents were well educated. Agnes O'Brien came from a well to do Irish Catholic family of lawyers and doctors in Rochester, New York, and was a graduate of Smith College. Leslie Connolly graduated from the University of Rochester and met his wife when both were school teachers in Rochester. By the time Robert was born, however, his father had given up teaching for a job as a reporter on the New York Herald Tribune. He was to stay with the Tribune for the rest of his life, later becoming the manager of the Tribune Fresh Air Fund, a charitable organization that operated summer camps for poor city children. His mother also worked for the Fresh Air Fund, as did the children when they were old enough to be counselors in the camps. And in this strong bond with the New York Herald Tribune, added to the literate reading-writing atmosphere of the home. When he was still a baby, the family moved to Amityville, Long Island, and Robert grew up there attending a parochial school and later Amityville High School. As a child, he was precocious and showed musical talent, but he was also sickly and fearful. He hated school and did not get along with his brothers and sisters, who considered him selfish and spoiled by an overprotective mother, but by the time he reached high school, he was happier and more successful in both scholarship and in human relations. He was admired particularly for his wit and for his musical ability. He was not good at contact sports, but he was a fast sprinter on the track team and an excellent swimmer. He was an editor of the school paper and showed a great facility with words, especially for turning out verse. In 1935, he entered Williams College, but the new situation brought stress and tension and he left college abruptly during his sophomore year. He worked briefly in Albany, New York before drifting back to his family in disgrace. Parents then being less tolerant of dropping out of college than they are now. It was an unhappy time he later referred to as his breakdown. But in a few months he was feeling better and he decided he really wanted to be a musician. Robert had begun taking piano lessons in high school and now he resumed taking them. Taking the train from Amityville into New York City to study at the Juilliard School of Music and to take extensive courses at Columbia University. The following year, his parents persuaded him to go back to college, this time to the University of Rochester where he could continue his music at Eastman School but also get a BA in English at the university. In the end, English won out. Although he always devoted much of his leisure time to music, he earned his living and made his greatest contribution writing English. After graduating from the University of Rochester in 1940 and a brief stint in an advertising agency, he went to work for Newsweek magazine in New York City. World War II was imminent and it was an exciting time for journalists. Protected from the draft by a 4-H classification based both on physical and psychological frailties, he was promoted from the clip desk to researcher to staff writer. In 1943, he married Sally McCaslin, a researcher in the books department of Newsweek, and in 1944, they moved to Washington, D.C., where he became a reporter covering Capitol Hill for the old Washington Times Herald. He had his son Christopher in 1944 and three daughters, Jane, born in 1948, Sarah, born in 1952, and Catherine, born in 1958. Music, reading, furniture making, and most important to his books, a growing interest in the world of nature. In 1951, he joined the staff of the National Geographic magazine, where the stories he wrote or edited encompassed the world. He wrote fiction only in the last 10 years of his life. He came to this interest late. Although he spent his adolescent summers in camps and as a counselor and swimming instructor, he grew up surprisingly oblivious to all but man-made creations. He did not even know the names of birds or trees, and it was a family joke that he called all flowers hydrangeas. At the same time, he was attracted to the quiet of the country, and he felt the need to escape from the pressure 
of job and city. In 1950, he bought a weekend place, a small house with 17 neglected acres on the North Ann River in an isolated section of Spotsylvania country, Virginia. It was here that he began for the first time to feel a connection with the river, the woods, and the wild animals around him. After three years of traveling to the country on weekends, he and his family opted for full-time rural living. They gave up the weekend place and bought a small farm near the Potomac River within the commuting distance of Washington. Here they raised chickens and ducks, chopped wood, and built fences, kept horses, and even had a cow. Connolly learned to milk the cow, although he never did belong well with large animals. They've always made him nervous, and he made them nervous. He used to vow that the most docile horse bit or kicked if he got within its vicinity. He likes small animals and birds, and his favorite of the many family pets was a small sparrow named Jenny, which one of his children had raised from a fledgling and which for several years occupied a cage in the dining room. Robert C. O'Brien, the writer, was to draw on all these experiences to recreate them in his books with the most painstaking details. In the early 1960s, he got an eye disease, glaucoma, the treatment of which affected his eyes so that he could no longer drive after dark. There were no public transportation and during the winter months he could not get home from work. The problem was resolved in 1963 with another move, this time back to the city. Now Robert was living 15 minutes from his office in a modern brick home in the city lot. Although he again would acquire a retreat in West Virginia, he had a lot of time in his hands and he began to systematically plan and to write a novel for children. He chose to write under the pen name because the geographic frown on outside writing by members of its staff. He chose the name O'Brien because it was his mother's name. The Silver Crown Ellen Carroll always knew she was a queen and the silver crown left on her pillow on her 10th birthday confirms it. People soon start attacking her and she does not know why. Ellen is forced to flee into the forest. While in the forest, she meets up with Otto, a young boy who becomes her friend and traveling companion on her way to her Aunt Sarah's house. But after Otto is captured and taken to the Black Castle, Ellen must find a way to enter the castle, save Otto, and destroy the evil Arianomis machine that is controlling the minds of thousands of people and turning them into dangerous and violent criminals. This book is a fantasy book. It is age appropriate for children of the age of 8 through 12. Miss Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Miss Frisbee is a young widow with four small children. She is faced with a great problem. She must move her family to their summer quarters immediately or face almost certain death, but her youngest son, Timothy, lies ill with pneumonia and must not be moved. Miss Frisbee had gone in search of Mr. Ages for medication for Timothy. When she was on her way back, she saves a young crow named Jeremy from the Fitzgibbon cat named Dragon. In order to repay the debt, Jeremy takes Miss Frisbee to see the Great Owl. The Great Owl advises Miss Frisbee to search for the rats of Nim that live in the rosebush on the Fitzgibbon's farm. While there, she discovers that her husband Jonathan is owed a great favor by the rats because he helped them escape from Nim. They agree to move the house for Miss Frisbee, but there is one problem. Someone must go into the house and drug Dragon. Miss Frisbee volunteers herself. While she is there drugging Dragon, she is caught by the Fitzgibbon's son and put in a cage. She overhears a conversation between Mr. Fitzgibbon and Nim. She immediately escapes and goes and warns the rats. The rats move, have moved her house by then and everything is fine. The rats disappear from the rose bush and Nim never finds them. This book is a genre of fantasy. It is age appropriate for children of the age of 8 through 12. Mr. O'Brien won the Newbery Medal Award along with the Lewis Carroll Shelf Award as well as an ALA Notable Book Award and an Honor Book Fanfare Award. See for Zachariah. Anne Burden is 16 years old and completely alone. The world as she once knew it is gone, ravaged by nuclear war that has taken everyone from her. For the past year, she has lived in the remote valley with no evidence of other survivors. 
but the smoke from a distant campfire shatters Anne's solitude. She sees this campfire from the monoculars up in a cave that she hides in because she sees someone coming. The person who's coming is Mr. Loomis and he is not who he appears to be. In his joy to have found an uncontaminated place to live, he goes and he bathes in a stream that is very radioactive. He eventually becomes sick. Anne goes and helps him and when he starts to get better, he starts to try to control Anne. He eventually tries to rape her and Anne takes off and hides in the cave again. He systematically takes away everything from Anne, all her supplies, her house, and then turns the family dog on her to try to find her so he can capture her. Eventually Anne tricks Mr. Loomis, gets the radiation suit, and lets him know that she's leaving the valley forever because she's had a dream that there are other people out there and she needs to find them. This unfortunately was the last book that Robert C. O'Brien wrote. This was a piece of fantasy fiction that is appropriate for 12 to 17 year olds. During the writing of the last chapter of this novel, Mr. O'Brien had a heart attack and died. Fortunately for us though, his wife and his daughter had enough material to be able to finish the book. So Mr. O'Brien died on March 5th in 1973 at the age of 55.